Hello and welcome to the MCA Services YouTube channel. In this presentation we're going to be discussing temperature program analyses and we're going to focus on temperature program reduction or TPR and we're going to show some examples of real analyses we've undertaken here. Uh, for example on silver oxide, the mixed cobalt 2,3 oxide CO3O4 and manganese dioxide. In another of our presentations on temperature programmed analyses, we showed the instrument setup and went through the various components and the analyses available to us. We showed how varying the carrier gas, for example, can be used to undertake different experiments, temperature program reduction, oxidation, decomposition and desorption. But here we're going to be focusing on TPR using our AutoChem instrument shown here. The chemistry of TPR analysis is actually quite straightforward. In this case, a metal oxide is reduced by hydrogen to form metal and water. To understand how this is represented by TPR, we need to consider changes in the detector signal as the experiment proceeds. The TCD output is typically displayed as a plot of temperature against TCD signal although we can also display the x-axis as units of time if we're interested in the duration required for complete reduction of a sample. If we calibrate the TCD signal response using the same gas mixture under the same experimental conditions, we can convert the TCD signal to specific hydrogen consumption. And from then on, we can go further and we can look at the kinetics of reduction and the activation energy of reduction. We start analysis below the reduction temperature of the sample. With additional cooling of the furnace, this can be subambient. To start with, as the, temp as the sample temperature is raised, there's no reaction between the sample and the hydrogen in the carrier gas stream. Therefore, the TCD signal remains unchanged from its baseline. When the temperature reaches the point at which reduction of the sample starts, Hydrogen in the analysis stream will be consumed by the sample and water formed during the reaction will be removed by a cold trap. The quantity of hydrogen in the analysis stream reaching the detector is then lower than that in the reference stream whilst hydrogen is reacting with the sample. And this creates an imbalance between the reference and the analysis streams at the TCD. The result is then a peak on the TPR plot. When the sample has been fully reduced, the balance between hydrogen content in the analysis and reference streams is restored and the TCD signal ret will return to its original baseline. So we've got two options with respect to increasing temperature. We can continue to increase temperature beyond the reduction phase of the analysis and await return of the TCD signal to its baseline, or we can stop the temperature ramp at some point during the reduction phase and continue measuring the TCD signal until it returns to the baseline. And this second option is quite useful when we want to establish the time required for complete reduction at a fixed temperature. We can now move on to show some examples of TPR analyses that we've undertaken here at MCA Services. We'll start with quite a simple profile. And this is the result of the analysis of silver 2 oxide. In this example, we're showing the plot of temperature against TCD signal. Analysis temperature in this case was from ambient to 275 degrees at a ramp rate of 10 degrees C per minute. And we've set the report to identify the peak maxima. For silver 2 oxide, we're seeing a single reduction peak starting at 130 degrees and continuing to 220 degrees with the maximum at 179 degrees. This plot is essentially the raw data showing temperature against TCD signal. But since we've calibrated the TCD response using the same carrier gas under the same conditions of flow rates, we can automatically calculate the hydrogen consumption. For this, this analysis, hydrogen consumption is 103 cubic centimetres per gram of silver oxide. And this matches the theoretical value of 105 cc per gram very, very well. Now, silver oxide is a good starting point when considering TPR because it gives a single well-defined peak. And this single peak suggests that re reduction is straightforward and in a single step. 
To consider more complicated cases and investigate the effects of analytical conditions, we've made a range of metal oxides here at MCA Services. We could simply have heated a metal salt beyond its decomposition temperature, essentially a thermal decomposition route. For example, copper carbonate is dehydrated and then thermally decomposed in a single step at around about 330 degrees. But we decided against this. Our aim was to prepare oxides of quite small particle size and high surface area. This would ensure that the available surface of the metal oxide particles is increased compared to the bulk material and potentially making the reduction pathway easier. To achieve this, we followed a precipitation approach, precipitating metal hydroxides from nitrates using a 0.5 molar solution of sodium hydroxide. Once completed, the sample was repeatedly washed in distilled water, vacuum filtered, dried at 50 degrees C overnight, and finally calcined at an appropriate temperature to form the metal oxide. The next example is that of manganese dioxide. This time we have two distinct reduction peaks, and they're not fully resolved, peak maximums being at 286 and 412 degrees. So the question is, why the two peaks? And in the case of manganese dioxide, this is because reduction proceeds via an intermediate. The first peak is due to the reduction of manganese 4 oxide to the spinel structured manganese 2 3 oxide, MN304. The second peak is then due to reduction of this MN304 to manganese 2 oxide, MNO. And no further reduction of MNO occurs, at least under these experimental conditions. But can we be sure that this is the case? Can we show that MNO2 is being reduced via an intermediate to MNO? Well, to start with, we can look at the hydrogen consumption. If we consider the complete process of MNO2 to MNO via the two-stage rate, we get a theoretical hydrogen consumption of 257.6 centimetres cubed per gram. So that's 257.6 centimetres cubed of hydrogen per gram of starting material. And the measured hydrogen consumption from this analysis is 258.6 dCs per gram. So that's in really good agreement and supports the notion that the final product here is MNO. The next step was to attempt to get better separation of the two peaks using the analytical variables we have available. So that's hydrogen concentration in the carrier gas, carrier gas flow rate and temperature ramp rate. But it turned out that the best separation had actually already been obtained under the conditions we started with. The dip between the two peaks occurs at 340 degrees under these conditions, and so we ran another experiment, but this time only increasing temperature to 300 degrees, so before the second reduction commences. And we held that temperature for 30 minutes and continued to record the TCD signal. From this, we obtained a single peak at 291 degrees, and that conforms really well with the first peak seen previously. After 30 minutes of holding at 300 degrees, the peaks almost returned to the baseline. The hydrogen consumption for this peak is 163.1 cc's per gram, whereas the theoretical hydrogen consumption for the reduction of MnO2 to Mn304 is 171.6. So the agreement's pretty good, and it supports the idea that the first step is indeed the reduction of MnO2 to Mn304. The slight difference in hydrogen consumptions could well be the failure of the peak to fully return to its baseline. It's also a good idea to look at the sample once the reduction experiment's finished and of course the furnace is cooled to room temperature. So in this case we removed the sample and we can see that we've got a brown powder and that's in excellent agreement with the expected colour of MN304. So the hydrogen consumption and the colour of the, the product at this stage are both in agreement with the intermediate phase being the reduction of MnO2 to MN304. We then analysed manganese dioxide again. This time we repeated 
the previous experiment, heating to 300 degrees, and then holding 300 degrees, this time for 40 minutes, a little longer to see if the fit peak fully resolved to the baseline. But this time we didn't remove the sample from the instrument. We cooled the furnace to below 50 degrees, and then we ran a second experiment, this time heating up to 600 degrees. The result now is that we only see one peak, and that's due to the reduction of manganese 2,3 oxide to manganese 2 oxide. So we've successfully isolated the two reduction peaks that we saw in the original experiment. And we've been able to do this because in that original experiment, there is a reasonable temperature separation between the two phases. Again, we've looked at the sample after the furnace has been cooled, and we can see that our starting sample, which was black MnO2, is now the green color of MnO. And we've photographed this one in situ on the instrument because MnO does have a tendency to oxidize back to Mn304. Finally, we can overlay each of these three analyses. The black trace shows the initial analysis, the full analysis, and the two peaks. The blue shows the isolation of the lower temperature reduction of MnO2 to Mn304. And the red shows the higher temperature reduction of MN304 to MNO. The red and blue profiles align really nicely with the respective peaks from the original analyses, and isolation of the two has therefore been achieved. But we can also consider hydrogen consumption of each of these. The original full analysis showing the two peaks has a hydrogen consumption of 256.9 cc per gram. So again, 256.9 cc of hydrogen per gram of starting material. Isolation of the two peaks yields 163.1 cc per gram for the first reduction and 92.4 for the second reduction, totaling 255.5 cc per gram, which is in really good agreement with that single analysis of 256.9. And finally, we compare that to the theoretical hydrogen consumption, which totals 257.6. So again, all in really good agreement. Our next example is TPR analysis of cobalt-2,3 oxide, CO304. Like manganese dioxide, we see two peaks. Although, depending on experimental conditions, we may only see one. We've altered the conditions to obtain the best separation of the two peaks. And the best we achieved is shown here using 30 cc per minute gas flow rate of 10% hydrogen in nitrogen with a temperature ramp rate of 10 degrees C per minute. So ultimately we can't completely separate or isolate these two peaks. Like manganese dioxide, the TPR profile is suggesting that the reduction proceeds via an intermediate. The first reduction, lower temperature reduction, is a reduction of CO304 to cobalt-2 oxide, COO. The second reduction is that of COO to metallic cobalt, so in this case we are reducing to the, to the metal. We can also consider the hydrogen consumption, and the total hydrogen consumption as measured is 375 cc per gram, and against the theoretical of 372 cc per gram, it's in really good agreement. And of course, we also look at the samples after reduction, and we've collected together all of them here. There's some black material left, which is unreduced CO304 from an experiment where we increased temperature ramp rate too far, but the majority of this is silvery gray metallic cobalt. The final oxide we're going to consider is copper 2 oxide, which should be a fairly straightforward reduction to metallic copper. Using the same conditions as we use for MnO2 and CO304, we can see evidence of two poorly separated peaks. And this is un uncommon for copper oxide, and originally it was assumed that the first side is due to the reduction of an amorphous phase, and the second is due to reduction of a crystalline phase. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And what we'll do is come on to look at the copper 2 oxide sample in another presentation 
and where we look at changing experimental conditions or the variables open to us to obtain the best separation of the two peaks possible. That just leaves me to say thank you for watching. We hope that you've found this useful and don't forget we do have other TPR presentations on our YouTube channel. They cover the instrument setup and the effects of changing experimental variables in using this copper 2 oxide example. Thanks for watching.